Good evening. Welcome to the House Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. Today is Tuesday, February 6th. Um, today we're going to be hearing from the Director Gray. First, Director Gray, the floor is yours. Welcome here. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Good evening. Um, I think I know most of you, but my name is Terry Gray. I'm the director of the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. I'm also the chairman of the Executive Climate Change Coordinating Council. With me this afternoon is Karen Bradbury from the Office of Energy Resources. So between DEM and OER, we have a lot of um, activities going on right now and a lot of responsibilities for implementing the Act on Climate. And one of the things that we wanted to do this afternoon is just spend a little time explaining kind of at a high level what we've been doing since you passed the Act on Climate in April of 2021. Thank you, Representative Carson, for your sponsorship of the Act. Um, and just really uh, really talk about a lot that has been happening and a lot that's, that's in the pipeline. Um, just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to, we're going to review some of the, uh, the nitty-gritty that's in the Act on Climate itself. I want to talk a little bit about our last greenhouse gas inventory, which is really kind of the scorecard that shows where Rhode Island is with respect to, with respect to complying with the terms of the Act. I want to talk a little bit about how the EC4 operates and, the, and how we're, uh, we're managing the budget that you passed for the first time last year. We appreciate that, so thank you. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the big sectors and private, especially we want to just highlight some of the federal funding opportunities that are going on right now between the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law and the um, Inflation Reduction Act. There's quite a bit of climate funding that are coming from the federal um, government to the states and all of the EC4 agencies are very actively um, going after that money. Um, just a quick review. The EC4 was created in the Act on Climate. It was created quite a while ago. There's 13 named agencies in the EC4, but that doesn't limit the, um, the, the agencies in the administration that are uh, participating. Um, more recently, we've brought the uh, Department of Labor and Training into the conversation, and they have been very active on workforce development um, as we transition into a green energy economy. Um, we're also working very closely now with, with the Rhode Island Department of, Advi of Education, the PUC, and we're going to be um, working to draw the Department of Housing into the conversation as well. So there's provisions in the Act that allow either me as chair of the EC4 or the governor to bring these agencies in and, and name them as participants, and we're moving forward in that, in that space. Um, some of the, you've probably seen this a few times, but um, these are the key requirements from the Act on Climate. There's a sequence of reductions in statewide greenhouse gases that need to be achieved every 10 years, starting in 2020. And then there's also a very comprehensive planning cycle that started in 2022 with an update of our greenhouse gas reduction plan, and then is moving very quickly into um, an effort to develop a climate action strategy. Now, the climate action strategy is a forward-looking plan that's going to tell us what we need to do in order to comply with the 2030, 2040, and 2050 reduction targets. Um, one of the other elements that's in the Act on Climate um, related to accountability and transparency is a dashboard with some measures. And that, that's very important in order to show everyone how the state's doing. Um, that is being developed right now under contract, and, um, and we are hoping to have a, a draft dashboard probably available this summer for public comment. Um, when you look at, at emissions from 2020, you can see some of the, the big players, right? So obviously in Rhode Island, the transportation sector is our biggest contributor. And that's 38% of, um, of our greenhouse gas emissions. Most of that is related to um, passenger vehicles and light duty trucks. So then you can see electricity consumption, residential heating, industry and commercial heating, um, which it can kind of be grouped as buildings. 
um, are big contributors as well. And then you see some of the smaller contributors. The good news from the 2020 inventory is that we easily achieved the reduction, that first reduction target in the act on climate. Now, a lot of people will say, well, that's kind of a false, a false achievement because of COVID, right? And, they, and the pandemic really drow, drove the economic activity down. Well, the fact of the matter is, is we had already met that reduction target before COVID in the 2019 inventory. And the 2020 inventory just reaffirmed that. Um, we will see an interesting inventory in 2021 and 2022 as the state and the rest of the world came out of the pandemic and economic activity um, started to increase. But, but that's, we're hoping that's offset by a lot of the, uh, the programs that we're going to talk about in a minute that have been now started to drive greenhouse gas emissions downward. Um, this is the trend. So it's a little graphic form, format of the same thing. You can see the, uh, the 2020 mandate, which is that 10% reduction. And you can see that we're pretty far below that and on a pretty good trajectory to, uh, to meet the 2030 mandate, which is much more aggressive, right? That's 45% below um, the 1990 baseline. Um, do we know if we're gonna meet the 2030 deadline uh, mandate? To be honest with you, not yet. That's what the 2025 climate action strategy is gonna tell us. There's gonna be some intense modeling of different alternatives that we're adopting to reduce greenhouse gases. Um, and that modeling is gonna show us, for instance, how many heat pumps do we need? How many EVs do we need? Um, what do we need to do in the power sector to continue to drive that reductions down and meet the mandates that we see? Um, at that point, we'll have very clear measures, very clear goals in terms of what we need to do. A little bit on, on the EC4. Um, the EC4 is, is that cabinet level dis, um, coordinating council that I mentioned earlier. We're also supported by the advisory council and the science and technical advisory board. Um, both of these have increased their membership over the past couple of years. The STAB in particular was having issues with a quorum. That's been resolved. They're meeting regularly now, and they're providing a, a lot of strong feedback to the EC4 and the member agencies on some of the policies that, that, um, that we're, we're working on. In terms of the budget that you passed last year, there was initial allocation of $3 million to the council. Um, we came together with all the agencies. We came up with a spending plan. We then put that spending plan out for public comment. Um, we got a good amount of comment, and then the council um, approved the spending plan in September. Right now, that, that money is being distributed out to the agencies, and, and they're really working on implementation. Um, looking ahead, the, uh, the way that the funding model is structured is we, we get up to $1.5 million per year out of the auction of allowances from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And that becomes the um, EC4 budget going forward. We plan to do exactly the same thing, which is once the dust clears on the budget, we will, uh, we will come together with the other agencies. We'll put together a spending plan for that $1.5 million We'll go out to public comment, and then, and then the council will vote on that next September. <laughs> this is, we'll never go through this quickly, but um, this is the spending plan. I think you have copies of this. Um, take a look at it. One of the things I'm proud of is we really distributed across a bunch of agencies. The money is such that it's not enough to support an ongoing program, but it is enough money to get pilots going and to get proof of concepts going. And that's what we're really focusing on doing in a lot of places. Turn it open. I'm up. You're up. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you, Chair Bennett, members of the committee, for the opportunity to join Director Gray today. Um, as the director mentioned, the federal government has made a historic investment in funding to address and mitigate climate change in Rhode Island is receiving its fair share of this funding and OER and DEM have a lot of work ahead of us. 
Um, so, Director Gray also mentioned that the transportation sector is the biggest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Rhode Island and actually nationwide. And um, OER has some programs to help um, reduce emissions from that sector. Back in 2022, our e-bike and EV rebate programs were launched, and they have been very successful. You can see the numbers in the handout. I don't just want to read <laughs> um, all the information on the handouts. Those numbers have increased slightly now that we have the January um, rebate information, and demand is growing. We don't see any decrease in the demand for those rebate programs. Um, we've also seen an increase in the registrations for zero emission vehicles. So consumers really want to um, do their part in reducing emissions in the transportation sector. Um, the infrastructure bill provides Rhode Island with roughly $23 million to build out our ch electric vehicle charging infrastructure. We are about to launch construction for phase one of the National Electrical Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program. Um, we have been instructed by DOT and DOE to install additional chargers along Route 95, which is our alternative fuel corridor. So work is going to begin at the Ashaway Park and Ride in Route 117. We think mid uh, February will be when construction will kick off. And then we will launch phase two, which is going to focus on community infrastructure. Um, there are some parameters. The, the infrastructure, where it's placed, will have to have um, 24-7 access, public access, but we will be in touch with um, communities as we move forward on that plan. Yeah, that's fine. And then some key highlights from what we are doing to address emissions in the electric sector and to move us toward the clean energy um, economy is we have Revolution Wind, the Final construction and operations plan, or a COP, as they call it, was approved by BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, back in November of 2023. Construction is underway. That project will provide 400 megawatts um, of electricity to Rhode Island, 304 megawatts to Connecticut, probably power 350. 50,000 households between the two states. Um, we also have two other projects in the area under construction, South Fork, which is New York-based, and um, Vineyard Wynn. But it's not, they're not just based, um, that's Massachusetts. It, the region benefits from mitigation of climate change, reduction of greenhouse gases, job creation, and economic development. And that is seen in... Um, Proport, where Revolution Wind is going to have a lot of their foundation components and the foundation components for other projects built at Proport. We also, I, I just want to do the procurement quick. Um, there is a new procurement for offshore wind. We extended the timeline until the end of March, and that is because um, the federal government is going to issue more guidance on tax credits, which we believe will lower the uh, rate per kilowatt. Okay. Um, another big program that we have is our Clean Heat RI Heat Pump Incentive Program, launched in September 23. As you can see, it's been successful, and our dashboard is now online at cleanheatri.com. And if you want more information, please reach out about that. Uh, the PUC has also opened a docket to explore gas system transformation in light of the Act on Climate. Both DEM and OER are part of the stakeholder group that is um, providing recommendations to the PUC and consultants. Uh, we think late Q2, early Q3 is when the final analysis and report will be released. In lead by example, the governor issued an updated executive order back in May. We expect to have a report on the progress for lead by example by May of this year. This is just a, 
excuse me. This is just a summary of, of some of the major federal funding opportunities that, um, that we are going after right now. Um, one of the big ones is the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. And this is a $3 million grant that came to, uh, to DEM through EPA to really kind of focus on that, um, that 2025 climate action strategy. And this is, the, this is gonna fund that modeling. It's gonna fund the community engagement that, that's gonna be necessary to get that plan to the finish line. And I think it, it's really advantageous that we get that support from the federal government. We are looking at grants, using this money, subgrants to community-based organizations to help them participate in the discussion on, um, on climate change response as well. Um, hand in hand with, with greenhouse gas reduction, which is kind of the focus tonight from the act on climate, is, um, is resilience. And I know many of you are focused on this. Um, we are in the final stages of putting together a very large grant application to NOAA on climate resilience. And <clears throat> this grant application is gonna be over $50 million. So it's really gonna be a game changer for Rhode Island, but that's just the beginning. There's other grant opportunities, there's other efforts that we're looking at with, um, with NOAA as well. And then um, our $64 million home energy rebate programs are expected to launch later this summer. We are receiving um, $64 million for home efficiency rebates and home electrification and appliance rebates. Uh, we're working on the program design. <laughs> there is a request for information out now. There's a link on our website and you can follow along as we get ready to launch the programs. We also have a coalition of state agencies, including DEM, the Infrastructure Bank, um, DLT for a solar for all application. This focuses on residential rooftop solar and community solar in disadvantaged communities. We expect to hear from EPA in March, late March, beginning of April on that grant. I think there's two themes that you'll see through all these grant applications if you really dug into them and went through them. One is workforce development that, like Karen mentioned, that's a big emphasis. We want to transform our workforce and transition our workforce so that they're in a good position to take advantage of the opportunities that come with the clean energy um, economy. The other piece is, is climate justice and the, and the elements of really making sure all of our communities can be engaged and, and benefit from the programs that we're talking about is, is a theme that runs through everything that we're doing right now. So both of those are really important focus areas. I wanna to touch real quickly on the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. Um, there's two parts of this, and we are right now in the middle of, of the, the first phase of the planning grant. Um, we've had a few, um, a few stakeholder meetings, and, and it's gonna to lead to something called the Priority Climate Action Plan. This is an EPA term, and it's gonna be an interim plan that's gonna come out um, at the end of February, actually, and be, it's due to EPA on March 1st. Um, what this is doing is it's kind, of set, it's kind of a gap analysis, and it looks at all our programs to try and find out where there are points that we don't have adequate funding support to meet our goals. And what that leads us to is the implementation grant. There's an implementation grant that's due on a quick turnaround time. It's due April 1st of this year, and there's a ton of money here. It's $4.3 billion nationally that are available to states and municipal organizations to, um, to fight climate change. The awards are anywhere between $2 million and $500 million. We're shooting in the middle there, more like somewhere in the, around the $50 million range that's not in the middle of that, but it's, it's the middle range, put it that way. Um, and we're looking at also partnering with some other states with potential um, coalition applications in addition to what um, we've got. The goal is to support the implementation of measures. That's the terminology that they use in this. And um, I'll talk a minute on some of the measures that we're focusing on. Um, I talked a little bit about equity and workforce development again. That's, those are themes that run through everything that we're doing. Some of, the, um, some of the places where the rubber hits the road with this is both OER and DEM 
have hired climate justice specialists. You may have heard from them in your travels. Um, we've also done environmental justice training for all the members of the EC4, the advisory board, and the STAB. Um, the climate justice hours are the, um, the events that the, the two uh, climate justice leads lead to, um, to get that dialogue going in a lot of ways. Um, these are some other pieces on resilience. I just want to touch on this very, very um, quickly because I think the reality is, right, if we eliminate all of our greenhouse gas emissions in Rhode Island tomorrow, we still have to prepare the state for the impacts of climate change that are going to happen with sea level rise, storm surge, and these more frequent, intense weather events that we're experiencing. So resilience has to remain top of mind when we're moving forward on this. And you can see some of the, uh, some of the points that, that um, I'm not going to read them all, but one of the things I'm, I'm really proud of is Governor McKee issued an updated executive order on resilience last May, and it designated a chief resilience officer within DEM. And we've hired Kim Carruth to, to fill that position. She started on January 1st, and she's starting to get um, – She's starting to get her plans together and get the outreach going to engage a lot of people across Rhode Island on resilience. Um, here's a little bit of what you can expect. So again, I already talked about several of these things, but the spending plan, the PCAP, and hopefully some mm -hmm. favorable decisions on these big grant applications are going to be uh, game changers for us. Um, Karen talked a little bit about NEVI phase two. I think that's the exciting part of NEVI because it gets off 95 and into our communities with more charging infrastructure. So that'll be interesting. And then you can see some of the other, the other pieces culminating in the 2021 greenhouse gas inventory next fall. So with that, I think we can just uh, be happy to engage any questions that you have from the committee. Thank you, Chairman. Director. Thank you, Mr. Bradbury. Uh, any questions for the Director? Any questions for me? No. Represent Over from the penalty box. box. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Box. I appreciate right. it. Um, you guys, this is wonderful. Thanks so much for all the hard work you put into this. I appreciate it greatly. Um, two things, and I think uh, more for Ms. Bradbury. When we're talking about the dashboards you guys are doing for not only the EVs, but also the heat pumps, are there geographic distributions on this as well so that we can kind of understand, like, especially our... our areas of the state yes. putting it. Yeah, that's yes. wonderful. And then are there any other things working with Rhode Island Energy, any updates to the grid that are more priorities that need to happen, or is that? Um, I don't want to speak for what the utility is going to do, but they were um, selected to begin negotiations with the Department of Energy on a rather large grant, Okay. Um, about $50 million to address. That might be helpful. Wonderful. That's great to hear. Thanks so much. I'll also say that... Um, with our climate implementation grant that's coming out, um, it will be submitted in April. We have been coordinating with the Rhode Island Energy to see if there's the different aspects of the system that we can help in that grant application as well. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Director, for um, doing this. It's super helpful, and I appreciate it. I just, uh, Oscar, uh, just a question, because I don't know the answer. Um, I know we passed it, but did we, have we funded it? Is that still waiting to be funded? No, um, you have funded it, so thank you for that. Um, the, uh, the, the, the delay in implementing OSCAR is because three agencies, DEM, RIB, and CRMC, all had to put together regulations on how to implement it. So we worked together and we did that. We've got the regulations in place right now. The um, the plan right now is for an RFP to go out for projects probably in the next month, and then and then those projects will be funded moving forward. Is that funded? Is that funded with uh, the, the original Oscar was like a nickel on each barrel of fossil fuel or whatnot? Is it currently funded out of the budget, or is it funded with a some sort of fossil fuel tax? Yeah, there's two unfortunate acronyms. One is OSPAR. Yeah. Which is the is the is the oil pollution response fund. That's the one that gets a nickel a gallon out of petroleum imports or nickel a barrel, excuse me. The Oscar was funded in the general revenue, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Representative Kislak. 
Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Director and Ms. Bradbury for being here and for all of the tremendous work you're doing for the state. This is really exciting to see this update, so thanks for coming here. I, I have two quick questions. The first one is if you could speak to what we, what you all are doing to make sure that Rhode Island doesn't leave any money on the table from the federal government to make sure we're maximizing uh, what we're getting here. I think, um, thank you, Representative. I think that rep that message has been delivered loud and clear from from everyone in the General Assembly, from the governor, from our congressional delegation. Um, that's a real that's a real clear directive. And I think all the EC4 agencies have been really focusing on on identifying um, opportunities and then just going after them as best we can. We're not going to be successful on all of them, but I do think that we're in the game on most of them. That's and I do think we're punching above our weight class on that. So we'll see. We'll see how some of these come out. But I, we, have been, we have been doing pretty well so far. Great. Thank you. And what support do you need from us, either this committee or the General Assembly, to support you in making that happen? Hmm. Um, I, think, I think just keeping, um, keeping an eye on the budget. Right. So um, not now, because those federal those federal opportunities are there. They're very strong. But the, the act on climate is a long game. Right. It goes out to 2050. And, and we're going to have to keep these programs running as we as we prove that they work and we prove the benefits of them. So I think that's something to keep focused on. So when we come out of this sort of land of opportunity, if you will, that we're in right now, we're really going to have to figure out what the what the really successful approaches are and keep driving on those. Thank you. Representative Fogarty. Thank you both. This is a very good piece of information that you've given us um, today. Um, but speaking of resiliency on the last page um, and the storms that we've been hit with, uh, I'd be remiss if seeing I represent South Kingstown and we have several representatives who are right along the shoreline. Um, and I'm sure you've been down there, and it's been pummeled, absolutely pummeled. So people always ask me, what are we, what are we going to do about the beaches down there? So while I have you here, it's DEM. <laughs> um, I, you know, I know I see, you know, happening on Long Island about, you know, ships and, you know, putting sand back onto the beaches. I know it's a very expensive process, um, but I, I don't know how these these beaches are going to come back. The, the, the southern facing, facing beach has really been annihilated this past. That, that is an excellent question, um, and um, thank you for bringing it up. It's, uh, it's also a tricky one. So the, um, I can tell you our approach at DEM right now with the state beaches, right now we're kind of in a wait-and-see mode. And, um, and what we know about the ocean is sometimes it takes the sand away and sometimes it brings the sand back. So we want to we wanna see how that ebb and flow sort of plays out but by the end of next month, we really have to kind of take stock and, and see where we are and how we need to get ready for the summer season. Um, we anticipate that, that we'll be okay on the state side. Um, some of the local beaches, some of the businesses on the coastline, some of the homes on the coastline are going to be in a different place. And, um, and we need to look at that. Um, one of the things that, that we, we need is, is a plan. And, and for instance, you, you mentioned Montauk and the beach replenishment, the dredging that's going on right now. Um, we need to figure out um, the, the plan for how that needs to be done or if it needs to be done in Rhode Island. Um, the other thing we've seen is, is the beaches that we air, have and the areas that we have that are protected by dunes have much less damage than some of the other areas that that aren't protected that way. It's nature's buffer zone, if you will, and it works. And, and we've seen that in the state beaches. So we really have to take a hard look at, at dune management as well. And I know CRMC is focusing on the, in on this a lot and really think about, about how that type of, of natural buffer can really, um, can really help protect us. I just worry about a lot of irons in the fire. Here, yeah, I'm right? sure. Yeah. I'm sure. And this has been an issue. I was on the town council for ten years. We were dealing with this 
many years ago. Um, but Matunic and East Matunic as your state beaches, and not to mention the other private beaches that are, or town beaches along the along the way, really took obviously drastic hits. I represent, you know, I have East Matunic is mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I know a lot of the sand gets pushed over to that wall, that the stone wall that's over there that where the Block Island Ferry comes out. I mean, if we could try to even start doing something along that lines to try to bring it back. It, it, the town beach in South Kingstown is, not that you would be concerned about that, but it, it's, I mean, I've seen, I can't believe how far back it's gone. We've lost, you know, um, you know, decking and all, and all that, and now it's we built back, and it's right up to that again. I mean, so there's not. I know it gives it back sometimes, and you're surprised. You're like, wow, it did kind of come back, but this one looks really, really bad. These past yeah. we got hit with three in a row there. And I I agree, and um, and it, it's not unique, right? Um, East Matunic, Matunic, they were both hit well or uh, hit hard. Um, Scarborough, Mesquamacet, they were mm -hmm. they were in the same boat, and that's just the state beaches. Right. So. Um, the uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of property in between there, including town beaches that that got the similar impact. So we need to we need to look at that. The problem with beach replenishment is if you don't do it right, you could spend millions of dollars to put sand back on the beach and the next storm, it's all gone again. So you really have to you really have to be careful on how that's engineered and how we approach that. It's true. I mean, they've done those taco things, those rolls that are put out there and, and try to hold it back. And I remember Dr. Boothroyd from the University of Rhode Island was talking about even seaweed replenishment out and not having the trawlers so close and the, that long seaweed kind of holds the sand in place and brings it back and forth. But he thinks that, well, this is going back about 15 years and I don't want to get off track here, but that a lot of that seaweed is gone and it's not holding the sand in place. So it might be something to, like we do on the the coastal lines putting that seed grass in along the rivers and um, maybe something we could start thinking about on our coastline too and keep the trawlers away and, and that will help us. But just, we need help down there. There's, there's no doubt about it. And while I have you here, I have to say something. So thank you. Vice oh, Chairman Phillips. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you, Representative Fogart, if you're, for um, acknowledging our shoreline in our community. <laughs> 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 it is our economic driver. All right, but I would like to um, just either one of you two, if you can expound on the EV charging systems or stations for the communities, because that's intriguing right now. Um, is it going to be a private-public partnership? Is it going to be run by the state? Is it going to re be run by the communities? What's, what can you tell us about that further? Um, I can tell you we are beginning to plan for phase two. I can tell you we are working on a survey that is going to go out to small businesses, communities, um, some of the trade associations like the convenience stores, looking for information on who's interested in having charging infrastructure located at their place of business, um, which communities want it. Um, and then from there, we will move forward, but everything will be um, managed with OER in the Department of Transportation as we're managing phase one of NEVI. Thank you. Representative McEntee. Thank you, Chairman Bennett. Uh, I just want to bounce off of what Representative Fogarty was saying. Uh, you know, the sand replenishment it's obviously a big problem in South County and all the way down to Westerly, I would say, uh, and especially this last storm. So in trying to get, you know, FEMA was down in Narragansett recently going through the beach, and, you know, I, I don't know if you're aware that the town of Narragansett was basically shut down uh, along the seawall. Uh, that road was just flooded right out so nobody could go through. And the beach really took a beating, the Narragansett Beach. And we know the sand is behind the Dunes Club down in the mouth of Narrow River. And we've been working on this for years, trying to figure out a way uh, to get monies to dredge that and put all that sand back on the beach. As opposed to what we usually do is spend forty, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year to truck sand in and put it back there, only for it to end up behind, back at the mouth of the river. If you've seen the beach lately, I mean, it's almost impassable when you get to the Dunes Club wall. I don't know if any of you have seen that. Uh, 
So there's a, there's a whole problem with getting sand back down to the other end. And obviously it'll keep moving back. What we've been told by CRMC, uh, soil samples, no problem. Uh, they, they hired some engineers to look at it. But um, we need maintenance plans. Once you do a big dredge, you have to have maintenance plans. Uh, and I know that's not a state beach, but the amount of money, and then in South Kingstown, when FEMA went down there, they have to move their pavilion back, their playground back, everything's gotta be moved back again. We did this years ago in South Kingstown, not too long ago, really. And um, when the town managers asked for the $100,000 reimbursement for the sand that they have to bring in to put back on the beach, FEMA denied that cover. They won't cover that kind of thing, which makes no sense to me. Move all your stuff back, uh, set up your beach again, but you have no sand. I mean, if you've seen, you probably have seen South Kingstown Beach. It, it looks like a war zone. You know, it's, it's bare ground now. There's very little beach. We know the sand is out in the middle somewhere, right? The, after years of working on the wall in Matunic, it was presented to us that that sand is somewhere between Block Island and uh, the shore. It's not that far out, but I mean, when you go to Florida, when you go to all these other states, even Massachusetts and Connecticut have sand replenishment programs for their beaches that are, so is it just a matter of money? It seems to me we have all the tools in the toolkit, but I think it's a matter of money. And trying to, if, we, if you look at what tourism brings into this state every year, it's like $1.9 billion in revenue. It's a lot of money. And, you know, if we don't have beaches to bring people down here, they're going to go to Cape Cod. They're going to go wherever else they can go. We can't lose this. We have a gorgeous shoreline. So I, I don't know where I'm really going with this, but is it money? I think it's money. I think it all comes down to dollars and cents. And, and, and unless we invest in it, we're going to lose it. I, I agree, and I think you hit on, on a core missing piece, which is the plan. And, um, and it's tough to, to figure out how much money you need to fix a problem without going through that planning exercise right now. And that's kind of a gap in the system. And there's different, they're, not, they're all kind of the same, but there's different categories of, of parties that have been impacted, right? There's the state beaches, there's the municipal beaches, there's the oceanfront businesses, mm -hmm. and then there's the oceanfront residents. All of those, right. all of those have kind of got hit with the same impacts from these storms but ultimately we need a plan to kind of figure out all right where are the priorities where are we going to where are we going to do this restoration mm -hmm. and that could lead to to a budget and um and then the funding request and but right now nobody knows how much money it, it's going to take it's 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 in the big millions it's a big millions yeah. just to dredge that sand out a narrow river i think it's going to be really I mean, there's, they say there's like over 150,000 cubic yards of sand back there. I mean, and now there's probably more because of these latest storms. Well, at least Narragansett knows where it is. We know where right. it is, but getting it out of there. And I guess it's easier to dredge from behind than it is to go out in the middle of the ocean and dredge and pump it back in, which is what you see them doing like Miami Beach, right, and some of the other... But those states invest in their beaches because they know how important it is. So that's it. Thank you. Dr. Speakman. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Thanks for coming. It's great, great information. Um, it's sort of connected to what Chairwoman McEntee was saying. Uh, there's a lot of money, a lot of programs. Uh, and is there the capacity both at the state level and at the municipal level to, to manage all this, especially the planning piece. So is there, in, in all of these slides and all of these lines, uh, is there a planning function and, and one that connects with the municipalities? So at the state level, there has been planning, there has been investments in planning. And, and as we move forward into implementation grants, there's usually, there's usually funding in there to support implementation that needs to extend down to the municipalities. That's, um, it hasn't yet um, consistently. Um, that's some of the lead by example pieces that I, I think Karen talked about earlier. Um, that's one of our intentions. But um, 
when we updated the 2022 greenhouse gas reduction plan, there's two gaps that kind of came out loud and clear. One was engagement with the business community and one was engagement with the municipal partners. And we're, we're, we're working on strategies to improve on both of those things. So not yet, but, but it's a work in progress. Now, now for the author of climate. Thank change. you, thank you, thank you, Chairman. Vice Chairman Carson. Actually, I was gonna ask about the, uh, I was gonna thank you for being here and uh, say a couple different things. I was gonna ask about the outreach to businesses and municipalities, and I'd like to maybe have you come back sometime or at least share with us individually what that plan is because the Act on Climate does mandate that. Mm -hmm. And they mandate that, and then the EJ participation and outreach. Um, there's lots of questions that I can ask you. I'm going to try to keep this um, short. Um, I think that if I, I'm going to commend Representative Spears for her act on coasts, which does begin looking at a plan for coasts. There are many of us on this committee that have co-sponsored that. So when that bill comes up, I hope this committee will take it seriously because we're hearing from the director himself that we need a plan. Right, we need a plan. Thank you, Terry. Um, you and I have discussed this recently, and I want to get some more questions on the table about the EC4. So when this plan is devised a year from December, will it be voted on? Who will oh. approve the plan yes, in, that, in December of the, 25? The EC4 will be, will be voting on the 2025 climate So that will plan. be the members of the EC4 that are identified in statute? Um, it's either the members of the EC4 that are identified in statute or the members of the EC4 that have been added for the governor. Right. So it says that the when I, I, I wanted to see that statute. You and I have talked about it. So it says that it says that the council shall include but not be limited to. Right. And then it identifies all the members of the EC4 by their job titles. I'm still concerned that those people that are not identified don't have the full authority as a member of the EC4. This does not tell me they have that. This only says that the council is not limited to. So did you actually see a vote on this in December of 2025? Is that, is that what you're gearing towards? Yes, that's what we did with the 2022 um, greenhouse gas reduction strategy update. We, Were there um, any non-statutory members that voted on it? No. Okay, so I still do think that we should be looking at adding uh, a school building authority and DLT to it and really identifying them as bona fide members because I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that something will happen and they won't be allowed to vote. They're, they're like quasi-members, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, in your opinion, you're welcoming them and encouraging them to participate fully, but to me, they're still quasi-members. So I, I am kind of concerned about that. I don't know if I'm going to do something about that this year. Maybe next year as you go to vote on this would be a more t uh, appropriate time to look at actually who's voting on this. So anyway, I just thought I would share that with you. So thanks for coming. I appreciate it very much. You're welcome. Anybody else? Seeing none. Thank you, Director. I appreciate Thank you. Very much. you. Um, Ms. Bradbury, I appreciate you also for bringing your knowledge to this committee. Thank you very much.